and he has also uh, been at Kistler Aerospace, so he's not a newcomer to the new space field, as they call it. And he also spent uh, 10 years at JSC working on, among other things, the space shuttle. So Blue Origin is not his first venture into reusable launch vehicles. Rob? Thank you, Frank. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to use the podium here. So. Good morning. And good morning, 67th ISU, and good morning, Guadalajara, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I, uh, on behalf of the entire Blue Origin team, delighted to be speaking on behalf of the International Astronautical Congress, and, uh, and so thank you. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> um, at Blue Origin, we imagine a future where millions of people are living and working among the stars, and not only astronauts from government space programs, but, but people like you and me. The, uh, the New Shepard space vehicle is designed to carry six people beyond 100 kilometers, the internationally recognized line of space. And, and once there, they will experience the thrill of weightlessness and breathtaking views from, uh, from Earth, of Earth from out of the largest windows to ever fly in space. But New Shepard is no ordinary rocket. Rockets have been flying to space for over 60 years, and they've always flown just one way. They're built to be expendable, and they're built to be launched just one time. After delivering their payloads into space, they fall quietly into the ocean and sink to the bottom. This is what we've come to know and expect in the aerospace industry, but not anymore. In November of last year, a New Shepard rocket, as we show here, launched into the air on its second mission. The rocket rose smoothly, and observers were able to watch it until its engine cut off at about 60 kilometers above the ground. Out of sight, the capsule separated from the booster, and both vehicles coasted to independent apogees above 100 kilometers altitude. Minutes later, onlookers reacquired the sight of the powerless booster, high in the sky on its 100 kilometer free fall to Earth. As it plunged toward the ground, and just as it appeared that it would certainly crash into the desert, a bright flash below the ship signaled that the BE-3 engine had restarted exactly as it had been designed. Within seconds, the descent rate was arrested by the engine thrust, and the rocket entered its slow and deliberate final landing phase. The landing legs deployed as the rocket disappeared into a large cloud of dust. The rocket remained hidden for several seconds until the breeze scattered the dust cloud and revealed an upright rocket with landing gear straddling the center of the landing pad. A perfect landing. Minutes later, the capsule made a slow descent to the ground and landed safely under its three parachutes. The reaction was euphoric. It was that incredible electric atmosphere that only happens when you do something monumental. Let's take a look at what that flight looked like. In this video that I'm about to show, there's an animated sequence in the middle of the video that will give you an idea of what it would be like to be an a passenger on New Shepard. Let's take a look. champagne soaked shirt never felt so good, so uh, uh, thank you. It was a, a beautiful flight, and that, uh, that rocket landing was a sight to behold. Um, hitting the, the center of a small landing pad for more than 100 kilometers up is truly an incredible feat, and, and balancing the rocket on, your fin on, the, on the plume of the rocket engine is like balancing a pencil on your fingertip. It's really no small task. So now I'd like to show you a different perspective, and that's the view out the window. So this next video I'm going to show is a video we took from our third flight of the exact same booster. Um, and we put a cam camera on board the booster looking out at the ring fin, which is used to stabilize the booster on descent. And I think this is one of the, the coolest videos we've developed. So here we go. The upper part of the video is the ring fin. And you'll see that, see that uh, fin deploy. And then as, as the vehicle decel decel decelerates into the atmosphere, you'll see that ring fin start to turn brown from the aerodynamic heating. Pretty, pretty neat and kind of unexpected. We put this camera on the vehicle just to look at the hydrogen vent on the ground and see how the hydrogen vent pulled away. 
and we got this great uh, horizon view. Now you can see that thing get a little bit brown. Just toasting the, the TPS with our protection system just a little bit. As we get lower in the atmosphere, we'll be able to see the West Texas and um, we'll see the Rio Grande River. Um, now that, that line is the hydraulic system. You'll see the drag brakes. Um, that we stay right there in the shadow, and uh, and that's the end. So these these videos never get old. I can keep watching them and watching them. So uh, what's next? Uh, since our historic flight in November, we've been used the vehicle four times, and we're about to fly it again next week. Um, this flight will be our in-flight escape test. Uh, about 45 seconds after liftoff, and about 16,000 feet altitude, um, we'll intentionally command an escape. Uh, redundant separation systems will sever the capsule from the booster at the same time that we ignite a separation uh, escape motor. Uh, the escape motor will instantly start to vector the thrust uh, to steer the capsule to the side out of the booster's path. And it will traverse, the capsule will then traverse twice through transonic velocities, through the most, the most, which is the most difficult control region. Uh, it will go through transonic on the way up through the acceleration and then a, again on the way down through the subsequent deceleration. The capsule will then coast, stabilized by reaction control thrusters, until it starts descending back into the atmosphere, uh, after which it will deploy its three drogue parachutes, which will in turn uh, deploy the three main parachutes, uh, and then the capsule will come down for a soft touchdown uh, after that. We're really very, very confident in this important escape system. We've done lots and lots of ground tests. We did a pad escape test, which is this image here, back in 2012. But there is no better test than a flight test, and we intend to do that soon. Um, as for the booster, um, the escape motor is going to slam that booster with 70,000 pounds of thrust. Um, and it's going to be delivered by hot, blistering hot exhaust. Um, and the force from that blast is going to try to both decelerate the booster and try to tip it over. And so if it tips too much, our thrust termination system will automatically cut off thrust um, to the engine. And in that case, the, the booster will, will fall into the West Texas desert and create a, a spectacular sight. Now, if the booster manages to right itself from the capsule blast, it will continue to fly its nominal mission and hopefully come down to a final soft landing on its landing pad, not unlike the video that you just showed, that you just saw. Now, I say I use the word hopefully because the booster was never designed for this type of a scenario. Um, it is most likely going to end up in pieces on the desert floor. Um, that said, the booster design is quite robust. We've done a lot of simulation. Our Monte Carlo simulations are showing a non-zero chance that the booster will survive. And uh, so we have a chance. Um, if it does, we'll throw this booster with this historic rocket a big party, a uh, proper retirement party. And we're going to put it in a museum somewhere, which we believe is a rightful place for it to be. Um, so be sure to tune in next week. We'll have a live webcast. And if you do, you're going to learn this, the outcome of this, this historic rocket at the same time we do. So when Jeff Bezos founded Blue Origin in 2000, this momentous mission, landing a rocket back from space, was always envisioned as one step in a long journey to see an enduring human presence in space. When that vision becomes reality, we'll look back on our blue planet, Earth, and consider it our origin. Not the origin of one agency or of one country. Earth is our blue origin. And we at Blue Origin are dedicated to making that vision our globally shared reality. There are many things that have to happen to turn that dream into reality. But the first and most important is to dramatically lower the cost and increase the safety of getting people and goods into space. That is the basic foundational building block of the new space economy. And that is what we at Blue Origin are dedicated to doing. While New Shepard makes it look easy, I can assure you that landing a rocket after flying it tail first through a 100-kilometer freefall is most definitely not easy. 
there are some significant challenges that need to be overcome. But, but the first of these challenges relates to engine thrust, and our BE3 engine has performed flawlessly on all of our missions. Uh, the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen BE3 engine is the first of its kind to be, to be developed in the U.S. in 15 years, and it is the first tap-off cycle engine to ever be developed and flown. It can continuously throttle from 110,000 pounds down to just under 20,000 pounds, enabling precise controlled vertical landings. The engine must balance its duties of decelerating the booster while decelerating, while simultaneously keeping the booster upright and guiding it to a small landing pad, and doing it as propellant levels are quickly approaching zero. There are significant aerodynamic and control challenges as well, as the rocket must be able, able to fly in both directions, managing a constantly moving center of pressure and center of gravity during descent. Individually, these are no small task, but taken together, they really present a huge design challenge. The reason we're doing New Shepard is to practice. Humans really get good at things that we practice. And uh, if you need surgery, if you want to go to a surgeon that does the surgery 10 times a day, not 10 times a year. Um, with New Shepard, we can fly hundreds of times and get really good at launching and landing, whereas with an orbital launcher, the flight rate is far, far lower. So along with continued operations of our New Shepard space vehicle, we are building an even larger rocket to take astronauts to orbital destinations. We call it New Glenn. It's shown here on this, on this chart. The, the New Glenn first stage is powered by seven BE-4 rocket engines, uh, and it will be reusable and be able to land vertically, just as we're demonstrating with our new Shepard rocket. New Glenn is designed for human spaceflight, but will also carry satellites to LEO and GEO. Now, the new Glenn with two stages will be the smallest orbital vehicle that we're ever going to build. Well, actually, this is the smallest vehicle we'll ever build. These are images from our recently completed wind tunnel tests that were used to develop the new Glenn aerodynamic database and to validate our computational fluid dynamics models. We know we're going to build more vehicles over time, and they'll just keep getting bigger. If we want to have millions of people living and working in space, we need a lot of launch cap capacity. In fact, uh, on the drawing board now is a vehicle we call New Armstrong, and uh, we're excited about that as well. Uh, people have asked us, why such a big rocket? Why do you need that? And the answer is simple. If you, if you want to have a future where there's millions of people living and working in space, you need launch capacity to create and support that, hum that space economy that will be needed to support those, those people. Where will this uh, next chapter of history take us? Uh, well, we've taken over Launch Complex 36 in Florida at Cape Canaveral, and uh, we'll be building our vehicles right across the street near the Kennedy Space Center um, in a 650,000 square foot manufacturing facility that we broke ground on in May of this year. Uh, we're very excited about that. Construction is progress progressing rapidly, and we're looking forward to, to opening up that facility at the end of 2017. Powering New Glenn will be a larger rocket engine, the BE-4. Uh, that burns liquefied natural gas and produces 550,000 pounds of thrust. We're well over halfway through the BE-4 development program with hundreds of tests completed on the pre-burner, the turbo machinery, the main injector, and the control valves. We're now developing the transient start, start sequence and we're making great progress. The BE-4 is the same engine that will be used to, to uh, that was selected by the premier uh, launch services company, United Launch Alliance. Uh, to power their new Vulcan rocket, and Vulcan will debut later this decade and will launch payloads to orbit and beyond. We're also proud to be a member of the Orbital ATK team, providing the BE-3U high-energy upper-stage engine for their next-generation launch vehicle. The BE-3U is a variant of that same BE-3 engine that powers our new Shepard uh, space vehicle for both launch and landing. Blue Origin has become the supplier of choice to the premier launch companies um, in the U.S., and it's a testament to the private investment that's been made in our engine line uh, over the last 10 years. A little more about the BE-4. At Blue Origin, we take advantage of the fact that we're coming of age in this era of high-performance computing and advanced manufacturing. We've made significant investments in 3D printing, in an automation, and in multiple uh, large laser-wielding robots in our factory so we can control critical processes in-house. While we're highly vertically integrated, 
we've also partnered with some very important suppliers to add speed and flexibility to our development. We're all in on adopting these new technologies that take full advantage of uh, modern tools, and the BE4 is taking this to a whole new level in our, in our development. The regeneratively cooled nozzle that you see in these photos is really a thing of beauty, and it takes advantage of all of our advanced manufacturing capabilities. Um, additive manufacturing, starting with New Shepard, has really allowed us to dramatically accelerate our development pace. As a matter of fact, we have over 400 th uh, additively manufactured parts on the New Shepard vehicle. Now, now here's another uh, part that we've made. Uh, this is the BE4 gaseous oxygen dome, or the GOX dome. Uh, this is the very top of the BE4 engine. And this is a part that we've chosen to manufacture with both traditional casting methods. The cast part is shown here. And we've also uh, manufactured it with an additive method. Uh, this unit here was cast uh, traditionally. It took over a year to produce. The additively manufactured part took, uh, took three months to produce. So a significant um, acceleration in development time uh, that we can take advantage of in building new rocket engines. We believe the additively manufactured version of this part is the largest additively manufactured part ever made. So this is our test stand in West Texas. Um, pairing our manufacturing technology with advanced computing and a hardware-rich testing philosophy allows us to take these advanced designs and then rapidly run them through the test program and, uh, and advance our understanding of the engine design. Uh, testing in our own facilities uh, has, allows us to move significantly faster than in other facilities. As a matter of fact, we're able to move five times faster in our own facilities, conducting multiple tests each and every day. As a matter of fact, in 2015, we conducted over 550 engine tests uh, when you add up both BE3 and BE4 at our West Texas site. That's an average of well over one test per day. So, so New Shepard is just the beginning. We've got some big plans, and to fulfill those plans, we need lots of talented people. Uh, in the last uh, nine months, we've, we've almost doubled in size to 800 people, and uh, we're currently adding hundreds of new jobs in our engineering, manufacturing, finance, and business operations departments. We've got an excellent delegation from Blue Origin here this week, and I encourage you to get to know them. Uh, Clay Mori just joined our team yesterday, and we're excited to have him on board. And then Brett Alexander, Alexander uh, Ariane Cornell, and Erica Wagner are also here. So I do hope that uh, uh, you get a chance to meet them and talk with them about the opportunities we have. We're truly excited to be opening our doors to the international community. And if you want to get updates on all the cool work that we're doing, uh, please go to our website, blueorigin.com, and sign up for updates. Uh, at Blue Origin, our motto is Gradatum Ferocitor, and that means step-by-step -step ferociously. So stay tuned. There are many more steps to come. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Very interesting. I, I love those movies, too. They're great. <laughs> Um, let me ask you a little bit about the, uh, the new Glenn, it being the new thing. Yeah. Can you tell us the, the capability that it will deliver, or you expect it to deliver for LEO, GEO, and then with your three-stage variant, how, how much you can throw out into deep space? So, so we're going to release more details on new Glenn in the first quarter of next year, and that's when we, we hope to talk more about payload performance and some of the details of, of the design and the schedule. Uh, and uh, but, uh, so, so it's, it's designed for, you know, it's a, it's a large uh, human space type vehicle, it, but it has capability to, to launch satellites to LEO and geosynchronous transfer orbit as well as, as, as beyond, so. And also you mentioned the, uh, the factory that you're, you're developing in, in Florida. You're also working on LC36, I believe. That's, that's What's the status of that work? Uh, oh, good, good. We are, um, so we're in the process of, uh, uh, the environmental assessment will, will be released very shortly, um, and we're working through that with the Air Force. There's a lot of regulatory uh, things that need to be worked through. Uh, we are well into the design of the, the, uh, the launch pad and the launch complex, uh, because that, that launch complex will have not only a launch pad for, for New Glenn, but it will have an acceptance test stand for BE-4 engines, as well as an integration facility. Um, we are, uh, are well along in the design phase there. We had a technical interchange meeting last week. Uh, with, our, with our launch vehicle team and working through all the details, so it's coming along well. We expect a breakdown shortly, as soon as we get approval from the Air Force. So. Are there questions? Yes, I see one right here. Any others so we can get set up? And one over here as well. I'm David Todd of Zero Data Space Intelligence and Spaceflight Magazine. 
Um, my question is, uh, is about the new Armstrong rocket you briefly mentioned. Is that supposed to be for Mars missions or th that sort of thing? Um, so the question was, is New Armstrong supposed to be for Mars missions or, or that sort of thing? New Armstrong will definitely be a larger vehicle. And like, as I mentioned, it's still on the drawing board. Um, it is going to be part of our long-term vision to, to um, have millions of people living and working in space. And so when we, when we have millions of people living and working in space, we want them to be able to go to lots of destinations. And Mars would be one of them. The moon would be another. So New Armstrong is really designed, is, is going to be designed to support that that long-term vision. And, and this is a vision that's, that's going to take decades to, to, to achieve. So, uh, um, so, okay. Thank you. Over here. In the front row. While we're getting a mic up to, oh, here she is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Myerson. I'm from South Africa. Now, I was very interested about the capability of the Blue Origin New Shepherd being able to do so many return flights. Mm -hmm. Exactly how many are we talking about? Because I heard you talking about four to six and then hundreds. So what are we looking at in the immediate future? Because my concern is you're able then to dramatically bring down the cost of the satellite use. So if you could just give us that um, estimate that you factored in. Thank you. OK. I, I, before you leave the mic, I think the question was about the number of people on New Shepard, or? No, what I'm talking about is the reusability. OK. You know, you mentioned four to yeah, six okay. times, and then yeah. hundreds of times, and I yeah. said the cost. Yeah. Yeah is very important to many countries. Yes, yes it is. And, and the, uh, so we've flown that same rocket multiple times, but uh, it's designed to, to be flown 100 times. And uh, as we fly it more and more and more and measure the loads and measure the environments on that rocket, we'll be able to advance and build future vehicles that will fly, fly more and more after that. Now, now, does it need to, is there a certain number it needs to uh, launch to close the business case? No, not really. They, we, we haven't set a price point for, for New Shepard yet, and we don't intend to until we, we fly humans into space next year. So uh, um, it is, uh, uh, we, think, we think it has you know, significant capabilities, and we'll be able to uh, um, take advantage of those. So, okay. Rob, I have a question for you. Yes, Based on your personal experience as um, a NASA engineer and now in uh, a new space private sector, mm -hmm. fairly uh, closed, uh, company. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the difference in the kind of, of work you do every day at Blue versus the kind of work you were doing every day at um, Johnson Space Center? Sure. Um, well, it's, I do my, I'm the president of the company at Blue, so my, the types of work I do is a little different now than what I did at the start of my career at, at Johnson Space Center. I was an air dynamicist uh, coming out of school. I worked on space shuttle and I worked on uh, crew rescue vehicle programs, uh, so very, very technical work. Lots of integration, lots of uh, working on teams um, of you know uh, aerospace, mechanical, and electrical engineers. Let me uh, let me refine my question a little sure. bit. Then, what would someone in that position be doing at Blue that would be different from what you did at JSC? Oh, well, in my particular background and where I came from, we were you know we partnered up with the folks at Rockwell International, and and while well, Rockwell was the prime contractor for the space shuttle, we were running wind tunnel tests and analyses together and, and working as, a, as an inter-center team. So it wouldn't be very much different for a, an aerodynamicist at NASA and an aerodynamicist at Blue. Um, different organizations are, are different. Some, some NASA centers are more research focused. Some NASA centers are more, um, more uh, contract management focused. So uh, there would be a, a bit of a change for, for some of those in the latter. Part. So I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get at the difference in the... Just the tell me what you want. I'm trying <laughs> <laughs> to, to get at the difference in, in, in the new space versus the, the yeah. traditional approach. How, how Blue does its business that's well, differently from... from I, I think it, it, yes, okay. I think it gets into one word, and that's risk. So um, NASA is... Uh, and, and I think in government space and the larger space organizations, you're going to be more risk averse. Um, at Blue, we're willing to take more risks, and, and, and I want to be clear that taking a risk doesn't mean you're taking a shortcut. It means you are knowingly and transparently um, deciding how you're, going to, how you're going to approach a program. 
And uh, um, so we take risks every day and we encourage our, our engineers and our team to take risks. Uh, we encourage them when they're doing so to communicate very clearly what it is they're doing and how, how those risks are, are um, how those risks are going to result in the expected outcome, which may be getting something done faster or, or you know, getting to that end goal quicker. So, okay. Thanks, yes. Yeah. One last question in the back. Is Blue, is Blue Origin currently developing a crew vehicle for a new, new Glenn? Yes, yes we are. And, and uh, the New Glenn is a human spaceflight vehicle, and we intend to uh, uh, we want to fly people to, uh, to low Earth orbit and beyond, so um, New Glenn, with, while the versions we showed have a payload fairing, it'll, uh, there's, there's other versions that will have a space vehicle on top. So, okay. Great. Well, Rob, thank you so much for yeah. an excellent presentation.